So this week's going to be a relatively short introduction lecture. Basically, I'm going to talk about the essentials of MariaDB. Uh, if you took 365, this is basically what, you know, a lot of this we learned in 365. But I'm going to accentuate some of the sections that we talked about that are going to be important in this course. And the first is the architecture for MariaDB, which is very similar to um, to MySQL, right? It's, a, it's nearly identical, really. Um, but basically, you've got a client. Uh, so your clients are going to connect to a server through the authorization uh, or through an authorization plugin, uh, which we haven't really gotten to yet. So we're going to talk about that in more detail starting next week. And then once authorized, uh, the client can submit queries, which go to a parser. The parser is basically uh, taking that information in SQL, checking to make sure you have permissions to access those resources, and then it's going to pass it to a query optimizer. The optimizer's job is to figure out how to use the storage engine and uh, how to most efficiently access that data. You know, it figures out, you know, can it use indexes? It tries to, you know, which we learned a little bit about last in the last semester or the last uh, quarter. It's going to figure out, you know, what uh, is it in the buffer, these files, which we'll learn about later on, you know, the cache, um, you know, all that little stuff it's going to try to figure out. And then it's going to connect to whichever database storage engine is being used. MariaDB supports lots of different storage engines, and I'll talk more about those here in a few minutes. But um, basically, it's going to connect uh, to the storage engine and, uh, well, not really connect to it. It's really going to just go right to the file system, right? Because the storage engine defines the structure of those, um, you know, of the of the files and the, and the files themselves, rather, for the storage engine that you select. Um, and then once that happens, you know, then we're going to go to disk memory and so forth and use those various uh, files. And that's pretty much it. That's the, uh, the architecture of MariaDB. So it's, it's good to understand this a little bit as we move forward. Um, obviously, you, you've used this already. If you've used MySQL or MariaDB, hopefully you've done it in the last class. If not, you'll start using it this week. Um, but the first thing we're going to really play with is the command line client for, uh, for MySQL, right? Uh, MySQL command, it's the MySQL command, and it really is a MySQL executable. It's a binary from MySQL, but uh, but it's compatible, right? So most of the things that work, all most of the client applications for MySQL also work for MariaDB. Uh, so they're mostly compatible. There's a little bit of drift starting to happen between MariaDB and MySQL, but for the most part, most of the stuff is going to work, and you're going to kind of see that. In this class, I'm going to, uh, you know, we'll use MySQL Workbench periodically, which also works fine, even though it's really for MySQL. It works fine with MariaDB. There's a few things that don't work right in it, but for the most part, a lot of things that you need for this class will work fine with MySQL Workbench and really just any day-to-day -day, uh, you know, stuff with your database. And the basic command you're going to use to connect from the from the SQL client is going to be the MySQL command, uh, dash U, and then the username, dash P, and then the password if you like. You can also just leave the password blank and it'll ask you for it. Um, and again, you're going to see that in the uh, in the first week, in the first project, you'll be playing around with the client. So if you've never used it before, you'll start to get your feet wet with that client. I would also recommend in the in the book, in the Maria, uh, in the in the Mastering Maria DB book, in the first chapter, there's a whole bunch of little exercises that you can do with the Maria DB SQL client, um, or with the MySQL client uh, when you connect to Maria DB rather. Um, and I recommend walking through those to familiarize yourself with the client if you've never used it. If you walk through some of those commands, you'll be a lot more comfortable uh, as we move forward in the class. You'll be a little bit more comfortable at that command line client. Um, one thing I should warn you is that we use Linux for the database engine. So if you haven't taken a Linux class, then um, some of this might be a little bit challenging. So make sure you reach out to me for help if you're not sure what to do if you haven't taken a Linux class yet. Uh, or if you don't remember from your Linux class, you know, make sure you let me know. But uh, but again, a lot of the stuff that you do in Linux, you're going to need in this class because we have to work with the file system, we have to work with services. Um, you know, we're going to work with networks a little bit with networking in Linux. So it's definitely good to be familiar with Linux for this course, as it was in the previous course that this is the follow-on to. So there are lots of different storage engines. The storage engine basically implements data handling at the storage level, right? Which are basically your files, right? It's how how it handles files. Uh, how it handles indexes, how it handles its caches like memory uh, and what's on disk and you know how that's managed and so forth. Um, so when we create tables, usually you want to define the storage engine or else the default's going to be used. And for the most part in uh, in MariaDB, the default is InnoDB. Um, it used to be in MySQL, it used to be MyISAM, um, but InnoDB is, uh, is usually used in MariaDB. And even I think newer versions of MySQL use InnoDB by default. So if you don't define it, it'll use the default uh, storage engine, but 
Um, but you can certainly define that when you create your table. Different tables can have different storage engines, which is kind of interesting in MariaDB, right? In MySQL is you can have completely different mechanisms for managing that data um, all within the same database or the same schema. Uh, we did learn how to do that in Info365. So you'll see that a little bit this week. So there are lots of different engines. We learned about some of these in the previous course. Um, you know, InnoDB is the default. It's transactional, meaning that it keeps track of transactions and you can, you can roll back transactions. Uh, it does support referential integrity by default. Um, ExtraDB is really what MariaDB uses, right? So ExtraDB is the storage engine used by MariaDB that's the, that's the drop-in replacement for InnoDB and MySQL. But they effectively work exactly the same. Um, and if you don't define the store, the default storage engine or the storage engine when you create a table by default, it's using extra DB, but it's mapped to InnoDB, meaning that you can use either term interchangeably in MariaDB. Your book talks a little bit more about that. Another one is TokuDB, which is basically like InnoDB, but it has uh, compression. So it, and it's very high compression, right? Um, and the reason it can do better compression is it groups the transactions so that it can... Um, Sort of like tarring, if you're familiar with how tar works in Linux, right? When you group data contiguously, you can you can more um, effect, efficiently use the storage space on disk. So that's one way that it does that. Um, but it is, again, it's much higher compression than InnoDB, but works very similar otherwise. Then you have MyICM and, and ARIA. Uh, these are very simple. Pardon the, the spelling mistake here on this slide, but they're very simple storage engines. They don't support foreign keys. They don't support transactions. Um, they're generally very good for, for when you have a lot of reads happening, right? So you've got some inserts happening, but, and maybe some updates, but mostly you're reading data out of the database. That's uh, really a good, a good application for my ISAM and area. Uh, OQ graph is another one that's geared towards visualization and spatial data. Um, you have black hole, which is basically a place to put your data that it never comes back, right? It's like the bit bucket. If you ever hear that term in Linux, um, you have spider, uh, connect, which is, um, connect is kind of neat because it's, it's basically a storage engine that it doesn't store data itself. It, it really is just a connector to a, uh, to a hierarchical database engine. I forget exactly which one, but, um, I think it's, um, the one for Apache, right? It's Apache's, uh, um, hierarchical database engine. Um, Cassandra, that's what it is. Sorry. It was on the tip of my tongue. So connect is basically allows you to use MySQL or MariaDB rather, use MariaDB as the front end to connect to and interface with Cassandra, which is kind of neat because that means you can have data in MariaDB and you can have data in Cassandra and work with it all from one platform. Uh, and you can use standard SQL statements to work with it. And the reason it works is, um, I don't know if I talked about this in the previous class, but there's a um, there's a, there's a data type, you know, we learned about data types, right? Like, um, you know, var char and integer and so forth. One of them is dynamic and the dynamic data type allows you to have, um, dynamic column names, right? Dynamic columns within a single field. And that's what allows it to mimic how a hierarchical database works by having multiple values within a single field. Um, you can get that sort of nesting, um, that you would get in a hierarchical database engine. So that functionality in InnoDB allows that to happen, right? That's how we can interact with it, just like it's a database within MariaDB, which is kind of a neat feature. Um, you've got Archive, which really isn't used much anymore, but it's another option. Um, uh, like I said, it's not, it's not very common anymore. You know, most people just use InnoDB, right? You don't really need Archive uh, as it, it really was just for long-term storage. It was like a long-term storage database. And then Sphinx, which I forget what that is, but Sequence is another one, which... Uh, really is nothing more than reading and write, uh, reading sequences. Um, Oracle has a similar mechanism. If you learned in, in an Oracle class how to use sequences, it works very similar to Oracle sequences, mostly for compatibility with applications that are written for things like Oracle. Um, so instead of having auto-incrementing IDs in your tables, you can use a sequence to insert your IDs uh, and guarantee uniqueness. Um, and you just have a different sequence for each table, but, uh, but that's a database engine that allows that to happen. So those are the various storage engines. We're going to probably start working with the logs, um, not in the next unit, but the unit after that, right? So starting in week four, we're going to start looking at these log files. You have standard error logs. Um, you can also use standard error output with MariaDB instead of using error logs that are internal to MariaDB. You'll find them in var slash log, um, the error log from MariaDB when you use standard error. 
Um, you also have a SQL error log, which is a plugin from ReaDB starting in 5, version 5.5, .5, which logs errors from SQL statements. So if somebody runs a SQL statement and they get an error, you can go find it in the SQL error log, which is useful for the DBA because uh, when somebody has a problem, they're going to ask, you know, they're going to say, hey, I couldn't run the SQL statement. What's going on? Uh, you've got a place that you can go and figure that out by looking in the SQL error log. Um, and then the general query log, which logs all of your SQL statements, right? So that can get pretty chatty. Um, and you can turn that off, right? You don't have to have that on. And then you have a slow query log, which is where you log queries that are um, taking longer than some configurable amount of time uh, or that don't have an index, right? So you can configure slow query logging so that anytime somebody does a query that's looking for data that's not in an index, uh, it gets logged for you so you can analyze that. And you can say, gee, you know, a lot of people are querying for phone numbers. Maybe we should have an index on phone number, which would increase the performance of the database, right? And we talked a little bit about how indexes work in the last class and how that might affect the performance of your database. So it's useful to see that stuff. And then you have your binary log, which uh, is a log that contains the data that is changed to a binary form. Uh, so for example, SQL statements and so forth. Uh, you know, and you have to use a log viewer usually if you're going to work with the uh, the binary logs or the bin log, and then the relay log, which exists in replication slaves, um, which are received by the master. So each entry in the slave's relay log matches an entry in the master's binary log. Um, so you can have common logging across the entire uh, cluster. So what are caches? Caches are how MariaDB controls memory usage. Obviously, databases are going to run a lot faster if they're if they're in memory, right? So if they're, if they're um, you know, when, when anything that runs in memory is going to be a lot faster, right? So you can configure. Now, the thing is, if you think about a very large database, you can't have the entire database running in memory, right? It, it, there's not enough memory to do that. So you have to configure, uh, you know, how it's going to utilize memory. And there are different things that it can put in memory. So buffer pool is one. The buffer pool are the table spaces and the pages and segments from table spaces that are in memory. So typically, data that you're working with is going to be in a buffer pool when you're working with data that's in an actual table space or in data. We'll learn about that here in a few minutes and we'll talk about that of course in much more detail in the course. And then you have key cache which is the index. So typically your indexes will be in memory uh, for your various tables and then your buffer pool is data from those tables that are you know pages of data. And then finally you've got your host cache which is basically all the people that are connected to your database. So that's going to use a little bit of memory as well. So if you have a lot of connections to your server, it can start using a little bit of memory, right? It's good to know that and understand that that could happen. Um, of these three, the largest should typically be the buffer pool. That should be somewhere around 70% on a, on a well-designed database server. Um, at least for MariaDB, you'll be around 70%. Um, all right, so let's see what else we have here. Uh, data structures. Uh, so the data structures that are used by MariaDB, this is basically how you know, the vernacular behind these, these storage engines, you have a table space, which is the actual file that contains data and indexes. Some storage engines store indexes in a separate file from the data, and some it's all in one file. And with some storage engines, table space can be multiple files. So when the table reaches a certain size, it might store it in multiple files, right? If you're familiar with other database engines, for example, um, you know, with other examples, you might have or other database engines like uh, like Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, sometimes all the table spaces are all in one giant file, right? And then you can have multiple files for your entire database. So there's different approaches to this. Uh, the system table space is where all of your your schemas are going to be in your transaction logs, and uh, we'll look at that starting in week four. I'm going to show you that, so we'll see what those um, you know what those files look like and how we can work with those files. Uh, segments are portions of these table space files, uh, and pages are usually a single row uh, or, or one or two rows. Um, so you have segments, which are groups of rows, and then you have your pages, which are just you know one or two records in a, in a page. Um, so that's basically the data structures. So this is the vernacular that you're going to see. It'll be in the textbook a few times. Well, it's not really a textbook, right, but our, our practical MariaDB book. Uh, we'll sometimes use this vernacular, table space, system, table space, segments, and pages. Uh, really starting at the top, table space is the file, and then within that file you've got segments and pages, essentially. And the pages are the individual records within those files. These are not files that we can just use, right? You, you can't go and open these files and get access to the data and, you know, see what's in the file, right? It's, it's not going to really be human readable. It's all in binary. 
um, it, you know, they're binary files. Uh, they're really designed to be used by the database storage engine. So um, I don't want you to think you can go and look in these files and kind of, you know, decode them. There are certainly tools and utilities that can do that for you. So for example, if you have a corrupt table space, uh, there are utilities that you can use to read the data from the table space and try to manipulate it or work with it to recover it. Uh, the database engine itself can usually do that as well. But, uh, but again, they're not human readable. We're going to start getting into authentication and permissions uh, next week. So that's where we're going to start the unit on authentication and permissions. So MariaDB has built in user authentication. Um, that's where the user is authenticated by their username, hostname, and password. All three are used in MariaDB. You got a little bit of taste of this if you took Info365. Uh, and this week, very briefly, we're going to see a little bit of this this week. But the bottom line is, is that by default, when you install MariaDB, it's built-in authentication, meaning it's not part of the operating system. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's baked into MariaDB. The user accounts are internal to MariaDB. They're actually stored in the schema in a table space, right, which we just learned about. Uh, there's a table space for users. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, mysql.user is where that's stored uh, in that schema. And you can work with them if you want directly, just like it's tables. Uh, if you want to insert a user, delete a user, edit a user, right, you can do that. Um, but again, that's what's built in, and that's kind of the simplest method for authentication. But then we're going to talk about some plugins. PAM allows you to use uh, Linux or Unix accounts with MySQL. Um, and then the LDAP plugin allows you to use uh, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, which is compatible with Active Directory. And in my opinion, that's pretty powerful because um, you don't want to have to manage user accounts in your database. Uh, it's better if there's some source of truth. And in most networks, that source of truth for user accounts, for better or for worse, is usually Active Directory, right? Something like 99.5% of companies in the world are using Active Directory for authentication. Uh, so if that's the case, LDAP is supported by Active Directory. So that means we can use Active Directory as our authentication mechanism um, with, uh, with MariaDB, which is, which is pretty useful. Um, and we're also going to learn a little about uh, authorization rules so you can configure who can access what within MariaDB. You know, you can restrict users so they can only access certain databases and even certain uh, schemas and table spaces. So we'll see a little bit about how that works when we get into that. Um, and of course, SSL encryption is supported by MySQL client connections and API connections to MariaDB, which uh, the APIs are usually MySQL APIs. As I said earlier, they're largely compatible. MySQL client applications are largely compatible with MariaDB. It keeps it nice and simple. Um, and it supports SSL encryption just like MySQL does. And of course, that's typically recommended to use SSL encryption. Uh, so it's obviously so the connection's encrypted to the database. So throughout the course, I'll probably reference MariaDB documentation. That's one of the resources that we're going to use. Um, Planet MariaDB is a uh, sort of collection of blogs about MariaDB. If you want to see what's going on in the MariaDB community, that's a resource that you can certainly look at. Uh, and then uh, um, there's a bug tracker and a place you can open bugs for MariaDB that your book talks about. And I put the URL here as well, so you can take a look at that if you wanted to. And uh, and that's it for Unit 1. So this is a relatively sim uh, short lecture video for unit one. I'm going to try to keep most of the lecture videos in this class relatively short so that we can spend more time working on those projects. Uh, and the project videos, you know, they may be a little bit longer because I'm usually trying to demonstrate how to do the projects. Just a quick word about the projects. Um, you know, my videos show you how to do the project. Um, you know, they're not designed to be instructive in the sense that uh, you know, you, you follow along with the video to see exactly what to do step by step. They're more designed to show you an example of doing the project, right? So usually what I do is I kind of write up the basic steps of the project. And instead of trying to give you a lot of detail in the step by step instructions, I try to show you how to do it um, in the video. That way, you know, you can go and research it yourself and do it on your own. Uh, or you can use my videos, or maybe you do most of it on your own, but you get stuck. And hey, let me see how Brian did that. Let me let me watch the video and you know fast forward to the part where Brian did it and see what he how he got through this this problem or something like that. And sometimes you'll see me troubleshoot a little bit in the videos. You'll kind of see my methodology of okay, this didn't work. Let me see how do I troubleshoot this to see why it didn't work. Um, but at the end of the day, you know all those videos will produce a working version of the project. So. Um, so if you certainly follow along with the entire video, mistakes and all, you'll end up with a working project at the end. But if you get frustrated, 
uh, by all means, reach out to me and I'll certainly help you. Um, but be sure to take a look at the project video for this week as well. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you.